I've been lifting weights for 10 years and during this time I went from 65 kilograms to 85 kilograms at my heaviest all naturally. In this video I'm going to share with you my evidence-based muscle building routine that covers nutrition, exercise and a lot more. You'll also hear commentary from Menno Henselmans who's a renowned bodybuilding coach and he's authored many scientific studies about diet and exercise. Yeah, muscle mass is not just important for looking good and bodybuilders. Muscle mass is vital for longevity. There are multiple studies that show that more muscular people live longer. First, let's talk about what causes muscle growth. Muscle hypertrophy describes the process of increasing muscle size by enlarging and expanding its extracellular matrix. This phenomenon is mediated by the activation of muscle satellite cells under sufficient mechanical stimuli. The primary stimulus for muscle growth is indisputably mechanical tension. Mechanical tension is what really drives the whole cascade of growth, but ultimately triggers muscle protein synthesis, which actually creates the contractile proteins that make the muscle bigger and stronger. Mechanical tension basically describes your muscles contracting at near maximum tension while lifting something. This causes the muscle fibers to strain. It then activates the main growth pathway in the body called mTOR that stimulates the expression of protein synthesis. So protein intake is essential for protein synthesis and muscle growth because your body needs substrate, essentially fuel, to create new proteins. If you just exercise and you're not on a high protein diet, then the best case scenario for your body is that it will catabolize some tissues to get the protein from there and then it builds them elsewhere. So basically you would just be breaking down your biceps to build your legs. And that's of course not what we want. We want the body to have enough fuel and a stimulus, strength training being the stimulus and nutrition being permissive to stimulate muscle growth. Mechanical tension can be applied with resistance training. Resistance training involves lifting weights, calisthenics, kettlebells, or any other movement where your muscles are forced to contract at near maximum tension. What's even more important is getting stronger over time. This phenomenon is called progressive overload. You progressively overload the mechanical tension to the muscles and the nervous system to keep the body adapting. You can achieve it in many different ways, such as lifting heavier, doing more reps, doing more sets, reducing the rest period between your sets or just training more frequently overall. But the main idea is increasing intensity and volume over time. Since mechanical tension is the primary driver of muscle growth and we want a sufficiently high level of tension, there is a minimum intensity of strength training or any type of exercise we need that seems to be about 30% of 1RM. So that's not heavy at all. That's enough to maximize muscle growth as long as you go close to failure. And then most studies at this point actually show that the rep range is not very important. You can go with five reps, 10 reps, all the way up to 30 reps, anywhere in that range, as long as you go pretty close to failure, you can get equal levels of total muscle growth. Um, as for the amount of sets then that you need, which is more important than the amount of repetitions, most research finds a dose response relationship with muscle growth. And the exact amount of volume you need varies a lot per individual, depending on your recovery capacity. But currently, the consensus thinking for most individuals is in the range of 10 to 20 sets per muscle group per week. I've worked out with both calisthenics and weights, and they both work as long as you keep applying progressive overload. With calisthenics, you'll have to do more reps or add the weighted component to increase the intensity. With weights, it's a bit easier because you can just put on a little bit more weight to the bar every time. In my experience, weights are superior for pure muscle hypertrophy because it's easier to enforce progressive overload, but you can easily do it with calisthenics as well. My main focus with resistance training is strength, and for that, I need to keep the intensities quite high in practice, it requires working out at about 80 to 90% of my one repetition maximum. That's why the amount of reps I do is somewhat lower. Usually I stick between five to six reps per set and I do about three to five sets per exercise. In total, I have three resistance training workouts per week, which appears to be optimal from a longevity perspective as highlighted by several recent meta-analyses. I stick primarily to the big compound lifts such as the squat, deadlift, bench press, pull-ups, rows, dips, etc. Then I add some accessory exercises for the hypertrophy effect, such as side lateral raises, forearm curls, and calves. However, I apply the principle of progressive overload to all the exercises. I try to always either increase the weight or do more reps. To actually build muscle, you need to stimulate protein synthesis. Resistance training already does that, but to actually build contractile tissue, you need to eat protein. So how much protein do you need? The recommended daily allowance for protein is 0.36 grams per pound of body weight 
or 0.8 grams per kilogram. However, many experts and nutritionists consider this to be inadequate, especially for the aging population among whom the RDA has been found to not sustain muscle mass. It's definitely not enough for athletes or people who are doing resistance training. At least for optimum health, you already want about 1.1 gram per kilogram. And for maximum muscle growth, you need at least 1.6 gram per kilogram. That's total protein intake per total body weight, according to our latest meta-analysis of the literature. Menno Henselmans and colleagues did a meta-analysis and found that the upper threshold for maximizing muscle growth is somewhere around 0.8 grams per pound or 1.6 gram per kilogram of lean body mass. Eating more than that isn't going to give more results, but you're leaving gains on the table if you're eating less than that. I weigh around 79 to 82 kilograms or 174 to 180 pounds. For me, the maximum protein intake would be 130 grams of protein. On most days, I achieve that, but on other days I eat a little bit more, up to 140 to 150 grams of protein per day. But what about meal frequency and meal timing? The generic advice you've heard is that you need to eat four to six meals a day to build muscle. The current thinking on meal frequency is that you probably need three meals per day to really maximize muscle growth. But there are a few studies that suggest that even with two meals or even one potentially, you can already get pretty far. I think that if you really want to maximize muscle growth, three meals is what you need. And some people actually even still think four. However, there are multiple studies on intermittent fasting, which find that at least when you're cutting, when you're in a weight loss diet, as long as you have a couple meals within, or even just two meals within an eight hour window, that can already actually suffice to retain muscle mass and build some muscle and strength. A 2018 review concluded that maximal muscle anabolism can be achieved by eating 0.4 grams per kilogram per meal of protein across four meals, spread four hours apart to reach a minimum of 1.6 gram per kilogram per day of protein. This is probably true for athletes who are really trying to maximize muscle growth. However, for regular people who just want to maintain and increase their muscle size slightly, then two to three meals even appears to be enough, as long as you reach a sufficiently high total protein intake for the day. I've been doing intermittent fasting for the last 10 years, and during this time, I've only consumed two protein meals per day. One comprising of a protein shake with 30 grams of protein, and then 100 grams of protein after my workout. I fast all the rest of the day with no other snacks or meals. This is supported by a very new 2023 study that found that a very large protein intake of 100 grams after resistance training results in a larger and longer anabolic response than a low protein intake of 25 grams. There was a dose-dependent increase in plasma amino acid availability and subsequent incorporation into muscle protein. Myofibrillar protein synthesis in the 100 gram protein group was about 30% higher than the 25 gram group over the 12-hour testing period. So having larger amounts of protein like 100 grams in one sitting doesn't hinder your progress in terms of muscle growth. And it might even be superior for some people who prefer intermittent fasting. Everyone's always asking me, what do I put into my protein shake? I'll tell you exactly what. It's 30 grams of whey protein, 10 grams of collagen, and one teaspoon of raw cacao. I blend it up with water and ice cubes, and it becomes incredibly creamy. Whey protein is the most bioavailable protein source in the world. Many studies have found that whey protein supplementation improves muscle growth and strength when combined with resistance training. Whey protein stimulates muscle protein synthesis 31% more than soy protein and 132% more than casein after resistance training. Whey protein also promotes glutathione production, which is the body's main antioxidant that supports immunity. The brand of whey protein I use, Nordcode, has pure organic whey from grass-fed cows from the Alps. It's the highest quality and cleanest whey protein in the world. I combine it with a Nordcode complete collagen that has added glycine, which is beneficial for joints and skin health. Nordcode also has organic raw cacao with lion's mane and chaga extracts, which improves cardiovascular health and energy. All of this for only 250 calories, over 30 grams of protein to maximize protein synthesis, and 10 grams of collagen for skin anti-aging benefits. If you're allergic to dairy, then Nordcode also has plant-based protein powder made from pea, hemp seed, and rice protein with added MCTs and maca. You can get a 10% discount by using the code SEAM10 at livehealthy.com forward slash collections forward slash Nord code. Another popular topic is the consumption of animal-based protein versus plant-based protein. Protein quality has been debated extensively over the past years. The consensus used to be very strongly that animal proteins were vastly superior to plant proteins. And 
I think there is no denying that, at least to some level, they are superior. We know that they are more digestible. We know that their amino acid ratio is more like that of human tissue. Therefore, you'll probably need less protein if you consume animal protein sources or in general, high quality protein sources. But if you consume the right type of plant protein sources, like 80% pea protein and 20% rice protein and mixed, that has a very high protein quality score for a vegan source. Most research at this point finds that if you're not interested in like really maximizing muscle growth, you'll be pretty close. And with those protein supplements, you'll you'll be very, very close, especially if you consume, say, 20% extra protein. Yes, animal-based proteins are higher quality in terms of their essential amino acid content and bioavailability. However, quantity is a quality of its own. If you're eating high amounts of plant-based proteins, especially plant-based protein powders that have added extra amino acids, then you'll get very similar results as animal protein. You just have to be consuming about 20 to 40% more of the plant-based protein to get the same results. So if you're a vegan, then instead of the 1.6 grams per kilogram per day, you'd want to aim for 2.2 grams per kilogram per day or one gram per pound of body weight. One hot topic on social media is using ice baths. <laughs> However, cold water exposure after lifting weights has been seen to blunt the muscle growth signal by reducing inflammation. And cold plunges are probably one of the most popular, decisively negative things we see in research. Like there is a lot of research at this point that excessive anti-inflammatory intervention, whether that's via a cold bath, antioxidant supplements, uh, NSAIDs like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, in high amounts, not like small amounts, but in high amounts, like a gram of vitamin C, for example, those have been shown in multiple studies to reduce muscle growth and strength development because what you're essentially doing is you're suppressing the inflammatory signal for muscle repair. Inflammation is not inherently bad, not when it comes from the muscle damage and that you did with your workout. In that sense, inflammation is like a signal for the body that says that essentially tells the immune system, hey, look here, we need help. And if you suppress that signal excessively, then the body doesn't send that help from the immune system and you essentially suppress the signal for muscle repair and growth. A 2021 systematic review and meta-analysis concluded that the regular use of cold water immersion has deleterious effects on resistance training adaptations, but doesn't appear to affect aerobic performance. So doing cold baths after cardio or interval training is fine and it can actually increase your recovery. However, cold baths after resistance training and lifting weights has been seen to blunt the muscle growth signal. It might be fine four to five hours after you lift it, but personally I have avoid all the cold water exposure after my workout until the next day. What I do after resistance training is sauna. There's a lot of studies about the cardiovascular health benefits of sauna therapy. However, it can also have benefits on exercise recovery. Heat therapy has a much more promising research backing at this point than cold therapy. Cold therapy is negative or neutral at best. There are some studies that find some potential benefits of heat. Infrared sauna, there was a recent study from Finland. A 2021 study on young healthy men saw that 12 sessions of high temperature sauna at 100 degrees Celsius improved bone mass and muscle mass. However, the overall evidence about sauna and muscle growth is very limited. Just going to the sauna isn't going to make you build muscle, but it might reduce muscle breakdown by increasing the expression of heat shock proteins and growth hormone that both have anti-catabolic effects. That's why sauna after lifting weights can help with recovery and also reduce the muscle protein breakdown. However, a 2022 randomized controlled trial saw that exercise combined with sauna lowered systolic blood pressure, total cholesterol, and increased VO2 max more than exercise alone. So the sauna appears to have much greater benefits for the cardiovascular system, which is very beneficial for longevity. And if you have good cardio, you have better endurance, then theoretically your lifting performance will also go up because you're going to get gassed out less and you'll be able to exercise for longer. So I take the sauna four times a week for the general health benefits benefits, but I time it after my resistance training workouts. Let's talk about supplements. The fitness industry is notorious for recommending dozens of different kinds of supplements that help you to build muscle and burn fat. While there are many different supplements you can take for the sake of muscle growth, there's only one supplement that appears to be superior to others besides protein powders. That supplement is creatine monohydrate. Creatine is certainly no magic, but it is the most established and science-backed supplement that we currently have as an ergogenic supplement that aids performance and improves muscle growth. In fact, it's pretty much the only supplement that really augments long-term strength development and muscle growth to a significant degree in research when you take a very big picture view 
of um, things that have a lot of independent replication. So it will help a little bit. Uh, some people are non-responders. Some people respond more uh, intensely and they gain one to two kilos of mostly water weight, but that's water that goes in your muscles. So it actually functions like muscle, looks like muscle. So I'd say, just take it. It might be water, but you know, it, it's uh, for all intents and purposes, it might, it might as well just be contractile tissue. There's a lot of research about how creatine increases maximal strength, power near maximum intensity exercise, lean body mass, and even reduces the incidence of injuries during training. The International Society of Sports Nutrition has released a statement saying that creatine monohydrate is the most effective ergogenic supplement for athletes in terms of high intensity exercise capacity, and it's safe with no reported side effects in healthy individuals. I take three grams of creatine a day during my muscle building phase but I don't take it when I'm trying to increase my VO2 max and cardio. That's because creatine has been consistently found to hinder VO2 max. That's probably because by taking creatine, your lean body mass will increase, which then makes it harder for you to do cardio. But if you're athletic enough and super fit, then it probably doesn't matter. That's it. This is my evidence-based muscle building routine that helps me to consistently build muscle and get stronger. Here's a short summary. Number one, do resistance training and aim for progressive overload. Number two, anything above 30% of your one rep max is enough to stimulate muscle growth, but you need to take it close to failure. Number three, work out two to four times a week for maximum results. Number four, eat at least 1.6 gram per kilogram or 0.8 grams per pound of body weight of protein every day ideally spread out in two to four meals. Don't take cold baths immediately after lifting weights. Take a sauna and a short cold shower instead. And lastly, supplement with creatine. One thing that we didn't cover is sleep, which is very important for muscle growth and recovery. Your body literally repairs itself during sleep. Check out my full evidence-based sleep routine on how to get better sleep. Link in the description. I'm mostly available on YouTube and Instagram. That's at menno.henselmans. And I'm currently in the process of the sale of this year's online PT certification program. So for people that are really into evidence-based fitness and consider themselves serious strength trainees, I would say, have a look. It is, in my view, by far the most evidence-based and practical education out there for fitness professionals. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure to click a like and subscribe for more future videos about living longer and staying healthier. Thanks for watching. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.